All rise. 17th Circuit Court is now in session. The Honorable Judge Jack Tura presiding. All right, good morning, be everyone. Please be, please be seated. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. You're welcome, Judge. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Circuit Court. Today, uh, we are in a virtual uh, courtroom to try the case of David King as parent and guardian of Charles King versus uh, Galaxy Gravel. Uh, before I begin with just a quick preliminary instruction for the trial, uh, I want to introduce a couple people. You heard from Joe. That's Joe Acosta. He is my uh, court deputy, uh, worked for the Broward Sheriff's Office. Also on the screen, you'll see Dee Dee. Dee Dee works for the uh, clerk of court, uh, Brenda Foreman, and her responsibility is to gather and keep and file any of the evidence that's admitted during the course of the trial. Um, as far as everybody else, uh, you'll see Deputy Garcia. Deputy Garcia is with the uh, court information system and he is assisting with uh, the juror into the breakout rooms and to help us uh, during the course of this uh, video operation. Um, so before we begin the trial then I'm going to read a brief instruction and we're going to go right into it. So as we begin this trial, because it is a different form of a trial, I wanted to give the, the jury some brief instructions. First, the jurors have completed questionnaires and submitted them to us via email. I have them all in my possession and I have forwarded them accordingly to the lawyers in the case. The trial of this case will be conducted remotely. By that, I mean the participants will not be in a courtroom and instead will be participating electronically over the Zoom platform. Um, Although the jury instructions and rules for conducting will be much the same as a trial in a courtroom, I need to emphasize some differences. First, uh, for everyone who is either observing or participating in the trial, please make sure you mute your microphones unless, uh, unless and until you're called upon to speak. It will cut down on interference. Trial of this case will be conducted remotely. By that I mean the participants will not be in a courtroom and instead will be participating electronically over the Zoom platform. Although the jury instructions and rules for conducting will be much the same as a trial in a courtroom, there are some differences. First, you will, you will be able to participate in the trial over the internet on a laptop, iPad, phone, computer, or other streaming device. Although you are permitted to use your electronic device to view the trial, all the orders which prohibit the use of such devices will be in place. In other words, you may only use that device for the purposes I set out in these instructions. You cannot use any electronic device during the course of the trial to take photographs, video recordings, or audio recordings of the proceedings in the virtual courtroom. Next, during the course of the trial, no other person may be with you in the room while you are streaming the trial as it proceeds. As the trial proceeds, if you need to contact us, please raise your hand to be recognized if you need to take a break or bring something to the court's attention. During the course of the trial, you should always keep your microphone on mute. At the conclusion of the attorney's questioning of a witness, the law permits you to ask questions. To do so, you must email the question for me to review with the attorneys. After review, if appropriate, I will ask the witness the question you posed. The attorneys may then ask follow-up questions if they choose. If you wish to ask a witness a question, you could email the question to Jay Tudor at 17th Florida Courts. Please remember you must ask the question before the witness leaves the virtual courtroom. You are permitted to take notes at your location during the trial. You should not share your notes with anyone as the case progresses. When you begin to consider the case, I will instruct you further on the use of notes during your deliberations. Therefore, the claims and defenses in this case are as follows. Charles King, a minor, through his father, claims that Galaxy Gravel was negligent in the maintenance and operation of its gravel pit property, which caused him harm. Galaxy Gravel, the defendant in this case, denies that the claim, denies those claims, and also claims that Charles King was himself negligent in the operation of his dirt bike. And with that said, uh, by agreement between the attorneys, uh, they have sorted out uh, each attorney's role in the case and uh, their uh, particular um, obligations. So in the, as the jury knows, or as I've instructed you previously, the plaintiff carries the burden of proof and therefore they get to go first. And in this case, then the plaintiff's opening statement will be by Rebecca Brock. Ms. Brock, you have the floor. 
May it please the court, counsel, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, Eric Rosen and I have the pleasure of representing Charles King, who also goes by Chip. Chip began riding his Suzuki motorbike at the age of nine under the guidance of his dad. By the age of 13, Chip had become a highly skilled motocross rider. He had earned a spot on his school's motocross team. He was recognized as a responsible rider by his motocross coach, Coach John Speed. And he was also recognized by his peers as one of the top motocross riders in the community. Riding his dirt bike was Chip's passion. And he hoped to continue to be a top competitor in the motocross industry. But all that changed on May 1st, 2017. Now you will learn that the defendant is in the business of uh, s selling gravel and has been since the late 1970s. The defendant's employees use a machine called an excavator to move the gravel into piles. And those piles create hills, sometimes up to 20 feet high. And those hills on the defendant's property create the perfect terrain for motocross riders. So for over 40 years, people like Chip's motocross coach, John Speed, have been regularly riding motorbikes on the defendant's property, commonly called the pits. The defendant knew it, as did the surrounding neighbors. Now, both sides are going to tell you that there was a no trespassing sign placed on the entrance gate to the property. We expect the defendant will tell you they did not like the riders there and they asked them, they told them to go away every time they saw them. But Chip will tell you no one ever told him to leave that property. And his friends and the other riders in the community even liked it when the defendant's employee and niece, Fiona Frazier, was working because she didn't seem to mind that the riders were there. On May 1st, 2017, when Chip was just 13 years old, he went to the pits to ride his dirt bike as he had over 200 times before. There was one particular hill on the property that had become a favorite amongst the advanced riders because of the, the speed the riders could get on the downslope. The riders had even worn a clear path up and down the hill from where the dirt bikes had packed the gravel. But this time was different than the times that he'd ridden the hill before. This time, when he got to the top of the hill, as he began his descent, the entire side of the hill was gone. Fiona Fraser had cleared that day just one side of the hill. Now Chip and the other riders knew that piles would be moved from time to time, but they'll tell you they had never seen just one side of the hill disappear. The only direction Chip could go was straight down. From 15 feet in the air, he fell. And he will tell you, he remembers being terrified as he was in a nosedive, staring straight down at the ground. When he crashed to the ground, he, the bike landed on him. The engine was still revving, and Chip was in excruciating pain because of the injury to his left arm. Chip fractured his left arm in the accident. And still, to this day, over three years after the accident, Chip has pain in his left arm and he has limited range of motion. He cannot lift his left arm above his chest level because of a permanent injury to his nerves. You will hear from Dr. Brent Dangerfield. He's a board certified neurologist. And he will tell you uh, he treated Chip for his ongoing pain and limitations. Dr. Dangerfield will tell you that Chip will need future treatment, including surgeries to correct his nerve injury. As a result of this injury, Chip has ongoing pain. He has difficulty with his schoolwork. His parents have to help him with everyday activities. He, his job opportunities are limited. Now Chip has tried to ride his motorbike since the date of the accident. But unfortunately, due to the pain and limitations, he will never compete in the motocross competition again. So we ask you to listen to the evidence today, including the defendant's knowledge of how often those motocross riders rode on the property for generations, for the lack of effort made by the defendant to keep the, the riders from entering the property. We ask you to find that the defendant failed to take the proper precautions to keep someone like Chip, from being hurt. Thank you for your time.
Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Brock. Uh, we'll now hear, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, from the defense, and Rick Penalta will present the defense opening statement. May it please the court, counsels, and members of the jury, I represent Galaxy Gravel. It's a small family-owned business that's been around since the 70s. And although we are all sorry that this young man was injured, uh, we feel that the evidence will show that liability rests solely with him. And let me explain why. Let me show you first what a gravel pit looks like. This is where they ride. Going back to the 70s, They've built gates blocking the entryways. They've put no trespassing signs all over the facility. All the employees, when they see the, the riders come in, which is normally after hours or on weekends, tell them to leave. Galaxy even sent security people out on several occasions to find out what they could do to, to secure the location. Again, the experts indicate nothing could have, could have been done. So for years, they've done everything they could to control the entry of these motorcycles and trespassing into that particular property. Now, let's go to May 1st, 2017. There's what the location looks like. And if you can see where the entrance is, this was a time when Ms. Frazier was the only person there. She went in and she removed some of the sand this morning. This wasn't done the day before, the day after. This was done on that day. In fact, it had been, it had been just so newly excavated that she was over at the site office on the bottom right at the time that the incident occurred. And you will hear that Mr. King was an experienced motocross rider. In fact, he was on the motocross team. What counsel didn't tell you is you will also hear from Mike Smith that, that will testify that one of the exciting things about riding around there in the terrain is that it's always changing. Not only is it always changing, but they know that there are times that the hills disappear from week to week. Now, right after the accident, there was a, an expert that came out on behalf of the defense, and by stipulation, uh, his testimony will, is in the, it will be in the record. And he went to the scene and he actually reconstructed on the top where it says well-worn path up to the X, the evidence will show that there is a 15 foot flat portion just before the cliff. 15 foot portion. And the reason that's important is because the plaintiff te will testify that he was traveling at, at 10 kilometers per hour. The expert on physical evidence will, will shows that there's actually, there's not only 15 uh, feet flat portion, but if, if the plaintiff was traveling at 10 kilometers per hour, as indicated, he would have had six to seven feet of stopping distance. And instead, by in measuring the, the, the actual skid marks left on the flat portion of the gravel, it indicates that the plaintiff was actually traveling at 30 miles, uh, 30 kilometers per hour. With regards to the medical treatment, the evidence will show that Mr. King was admitted to the hospital. He, there were no surgical interventions. The fracture was immobilized, and in fact, for only for several weeks. And then there was literally a three-year gap in treatment. And he did ride. In fact, there he is riding. So three-year gap in treatment. I would, I would ask at the end of the testimony that you find the only evidence that, the only verdict that the evidence supports and that justice demands. 
and that is a not that Mr. Galaxy was not responsible for this accident. For the points of the gates blocking the entry, the no trespassing signs, employees told him to get off the property. The coach actually threatened to kick them off if they remained on the on the property, and would and the fact that the terrain was changing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Penalta. All right, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you've heard the positions of both sides. We're now gonna begin with the evidence. And as I cautioned you earlier, uh, the burden starts with the plaintiff and rests with the plaintiff, and they're gonna begin their case first. So I'm led to believe uh, Ms. Brock is uh, Dr. Dangerfield, the first witness? Yes, Judge, the plaintiff calls Dr. Brent Dangerfield. All right, Didi, if you turn your microphone, where's the doc doctor, if you'd raise your right hand, our clerk of court's gonna swear you in. Good morning, Your Honor. I, I believe my, oh, there we go. Your, your microphone is on. Got Dee, it. Dee, make, Dee Dee, make sure you turn yours on and swear the witness. Doctor, if you raise your right hand, do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give us during the course of these proceedings will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you, sir. You may inquire, ma'am. Thank you. Good morning, doctor. Will you please introduce yourself to the jury? Uh, good morning. My name is Brent Dangerfield, and I'm a neurologist. Are you a board-certified neurologist? I am. Did you have an opportunity to uh, treat Chip after his dirt bike crash? Uh, yes, I did. How old was he when he first came to you for treatment? So I saw him in March of this year. So he was 16 years old. What were his complaints when he came to treat with you? Uh, I understand by way of the history that was provided to me, he had injured his arm in a motor, uh, uh, motorcycle, motocross incident, and uh, was still complaining about having some residual uh, issues with his arm. And what were those residual issues? So he was complaining that he was unable to lift his left arm above his chest. What uh, specifically were Chip's injuries as a result of the accident? And I'm going to show you what's been admitted into evidence as Exhibit 2. Sure. So uh, at first, as a result of the initial uh, motor vehicle accident, uh, he appears to have suffered a fracture to his arm, uh, being his left arm, which appears to have been immobilized and appropriately reduced no longer symptomatic at the time he was speaking to me. Did he need physical therapy for that fracture? Uh, it appears through my review, he completed three courses of uh, physical therapy, which appeared to have been uh, resolved, uh, the orthopedic complaints. And is the fracture resolved? Yes. Then anatomically, can you please explain to the jury what is causing his ongoing complaints? Sure. Uh, Based upon my neurological examination, it appears that he had suffered, uh, as a result of this uh, motor vehicle accident, an injury to his brachial plexus. Brachial I'm, plexus is, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Dr. Dangerfield, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sh uh, put up what's been marked as, and admitted as exhibit six, or marked as exhibit six. Sure. Maybe, the, maybe this will help you explain to the jury. Uh, yes, thank you. So the brachial plexus is a bundle of nerves that emanate in the cervical section of the spinal cord, and they run down the chest, shoulder, and arm. And they are the nerves that are responsible for innervating the arm, shoulder, wrist. Um, so his, upon examination, it appears that he had reduced sensation in uh, some of his fingertips and was unable to bend uh, his elbow and raise his uh, arm above shoulder length. Are these, uh, is this injury and these complaints, are, are they permanent? Yes, um, any kind of peripheral nerve injury, uh, you would expect the greatest improvement to occur within the first six to 12 months of the injury. Uh, being three years post-accident and being able to examine his arm and seeing the decreased muscle tone, the atrophy, and the inability to raise his arm, um, that's an injury that's, that's not going to get any better than it is at this moment. Dr. Dangerfield, did the, were the injuries caused by the dirt bike crash, the injuries you've described? 
Yes, uh, the a brachial plexus injury is very common uh, in motorcycle accidents, and essentially they're a, a result of someone having traction applied to the neck while their arm is outstretched. Um, uh, if the arm is kind of at the side, you'd see a injury to the lower trunk of the brachial plexus. This seems to be an upper uh, portion of the brachial plexus that was injured, which would indicate his arm was outstretched at the time uh, of his injury, which is consistent with having a fracture of the arm as well. What treatment will he need in the future? Uh, in terms of treatment, I, I think he's at maximum medical improvement. I think if he wanted to have uh, some more uh, of his neurologic function, uh, you know, have some of that restored. There are some treatments that are available. He could have a microneurolysis where we would attempt to go in and remove the neuroma that had formed on the C5 um, particular nerve root. Uh, that could, you know, while that could get rid of what is uh, causing the neurologic deficits, it could cause fur further injury to the nerves as well. Or we could do a nerve graft, which we would remove the sural nerve, which runs down the back of his uh, knee and graft it onto uh, C5. However, he would then have a pretty bad scar on the back of his knee and lose sensation to the outside of his foot. So those could be beneficial to him, uh, but you know, nothing is guaranteed. How much would these procedures cost? Those procedures would uh, be about $250,000 uh, from start to finish. Are there activities that Chip will never be able to do again? Because of his neurologic deficits, he's going to have a tough time engaging in activities where he has to uh, lift things above the head. Um, I don't think he's going to be riding uh, a motorcycle anymore uh, because of the uh, amount of rotation uh, that, you know, to steer and to operate it safely uh, that he's going to use uh, based on his injury to the lateral cord. And you say, uh, you mean for, com for uh, competitive purposes, is that correct? Correct. That's Dr. correct. Dr. Dangerfield, thank you. Have all of your opinions you've given us today been made within a reasonable degree of medical probability? Yes, they have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. McLean. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, now we're going to hear uh, from the other side on cross-examination, and uh, Dale Blackmore will be conducting cross-examination of the doctor. Me. Thank you, Honor. May it please the court. Can you hear me? I can hear you. The answer is Doctor, yes. I had mine on mute. Doctor, you only saw Mr. King one time, correct? Yes, that is true. And the left arm fracture resolved completely, correct? Yes. The fracture was simply set, casted, and did, it was only about two weeks that he had to use the cast, and there were no surgical interventions as a result of that surgery, correct? All right, Ms. Blackmore. I mean, as a result of the, yes. Your microphone is cutting out a little bit, so maybe go a little slower. You're getting a little bit of feedback. Ask the question again to the doctor, please. The fracture only required casting, right? That's correct. And no surgery was involved, right? Also true. There are no records of any x-rays that were taken of the shoulder or the elbow, correct? That's correct. None that I saw. And the only x-rays of the cervical spine were the ones that you took on March 1st, 2020, right? That is true, yes. And those x-rays showed normal vertebral alignment, right? Yes. The only MRI scan of the cervical spine was taken in mid-February 2020, right? Uh, that, was, that is correct. There were no other records provided to you of any other MRIs of any other body parts that predated February 2020, correct? Yes, that was the only uh, scans that I had. To your knowledge, has Mr. King been examined by any other neurologist, either before 
or after you saw him on March 1st, 2020? Uh, not to my knowledge, no. And that's not reflected in your record, right? Correct. And the history you took came from his 16-year-old Chip King, didn't it? Uh, that is correct, although I believe his father was present as well. But you don't note in your record that his father gave you any input as to his history. That's not noted in your record, is it, Doctor? No, I did not note it. Uh, doctor, I didn't see it in your records. Did Chip tell you when he first started having symptoms of what you described as neurological pain and the inability for him to be able to raise his left arm above his chest level? No, he did not provide the date of onset. And you would have noted that if he told you that specifically, wouldn't you? Yes, I would have. When you reviewed the physical therapy records, your report didn't note when those neurological symptoms first appeared, correct? That's correct. You saw a C5 neuroma on the MRI that was taken in February 20, but you cannot tell us and you cannot tell the jury when that for neuroma first appeared, can you, doctor? Can you please repeat your question? Part of it cut out. When you, you saw a C5 neuroma on the cervical spine the MRI that was taken February 2020, but you cannot tell the members of the jury when that neuroma appeared on that MRI, can you? That is true. And to your knowledge, is this the only MRI that was ever taken after Chip yeah. crashed his motorcycle? Would you agree MRI. that I didn't mean to interrupt you, doctor. Would you agree that when a person is experiencing the kind of neurological pain and symptoms and inability to raise his left arm, as he described, uh, that the sooner he would be evaluated by a neurologist, the better? So normally you want to have a wait and see approach with these neurologic injuries, especially things to the peripheral nerves because they do have the propensity to regenerate. Um, but, you know, I would have expected him to see someone earlier than uh, the three year mark that I was seeing. Now, yes. you testified about some possible surgery, but you don't perform surgeries as a neurologist, do you, doctor? That's correct. I'm not a neurosurgeon. And therefore, you don't bill for any kind of surgical procedures either, do you? I do not, no. A neurosurgeon would determine if any surgery procedures are necessary, right? Well, they, they would perform the procedure, but in terms of diagnosing a neurologic injury and the appropriate course, even though it's not something that I do, um, you know, it's within my specialty, yes. Now, Mr. King told you, or you noted in your uh, record that he will never ride a dirt bike again. But when you took his history, did he tell you that he rode his bike after this accident? Uh, no, he did not tell me that. And you were provided with some films uh, and records uh, in order to give an opinion in this case. Uh, I would like to show you a photo and ask you if you were ever provided with this photo. Can you see it? No. Uh, Jim, hypothetically, what's in the exhibit? When you were provided with films, no one provided you with the photo that he posted on Facebook of him driving or riding his motorbike in full motorbike uh, gear uh, after this accident. You never saw that photo, did you, doctor? Uh, no, I did not see that photo. Thank you. I have no further questions. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Blackmore. All right. Uh
continuing with the plaintiff's case. Um, Mr. Rosen, call your next witness. Plaintiff calls Charles King. All right, Mr. King, where are you? If you would please um, raise your right hand. Did we figure, uh, Didi, you look like you're unmuted. Will you swear the witness now? Raise your right hand for me. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you should give in this case shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right, counsel. May it please the court. Um, uh, Mr. King, introduce yourself to the folks in the jury, please. Uh, my name is uh, Charles King, but no one calls me Charles. Everyone calls me Chip. How old are you, Chip? Uh, I'm 16 years old. And we're going to be talking about an incident that happened on May, May 1st, 2017. How old were you when the crash happened? I was 13. What were you doing on the day of the incident? Uh, I had taken my motorbike out uh, to practice. Uh, I had a big race coming up, so I took it up on the uh, Galaxy Gravel Pit uh, Road. How long had you been riding dirt bikes um, by that time in your life? I started when I was nine years old, and I've ridden continuously up until the accident. How much experience did you have riding? Oh, a lot. I was, I was, uh, uh, I rode as often as I could every weekend. I was on the school's motocross team. And um, before the date of this crash of uh, May 1st, 2017, how many times had you been to the gravel pit? Oh, gosh, Mr. Rosen, so many times, at least 200 times, maybe more. Who else would you see riding over those 200 period? 200 times, who else would you see riding over at the Galaxy Gravel Pits? My friends would ride, uh, other members of the school team would ride, kids we didn't know uh, would come and ride there. And over the years that you went to the Galaxy Gravel Pit, were you ever asked to leave by anyone who worked there? I was, I was never asked to leave by anybody. Were you ever hassled by anybody who worked there? No, never. Was there any type of fence that surrounded the property to, to stop you from going in? Uh, no fence whatsoever. So tell the jury how the, how the crash happened. What happened? Well, because we all rode there a lot, there was this well-packed trail going up this one hill, and that's where you usually started when you went in. So I was going up that well-packed uh, trail, and I got to the top, and, and I was going maybe seven miles an hour. I had my feet out for balance, and all of a sudden, the trail just disappeared. And I, I, I fell off the other side, straight down, like 15 feet. What happened, what happened to your arm? Uh, I stretched my arms out to sort of break my fall, and, and I, I, I broke my arm. The, the pain was excruciating. Uh, the bike came down and fell on top of me, and it was still running uh, uh, while I was laying there on the ground. Um, we're, three years, we're three years out from the crash. How is your arm now? Uh, painful. I, I, I can't lift it up past my chest. You know, you, you asked me to put on a tie for trial, and I, I went to put a tie on this morning. I couldn't tie my tie. Since the date of the crash, have you been in any other accidents where you injured your arm or your neck? No. Have you been able to ride a motorcycle since the crash? Yeah, I tried a couple times, and, and I just couldn't do it. The, the pain was so bad, I, I felt unsafe. So other than those couple times I tried, I haven't. How has your injury affected your life? Please tell the jury. Well... With the pain, like I said, I can't ride my bike anymore. I, I have trouble focusing at school. Uh, my mom and dad have to help me do stuff around the house. Uh, I, 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 I just am in constant pain. What kind of things do your mom and dad have to do to help you around the house? Well, I have some chores that, that I've got to do. And you know, some of the things that, that I, 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 you know, I can't lift up, you know, cleaning uh, the yard, raking, I can't do that because it, it takes two hands. Uh, so, and, and, and I feel bad because 
it's, it's something we, we did as a family, and I, I just can't get the chores done. How does it make you feel that you can't put your own tie on? You know, it's, it's something I should be able to do. It, it, it's embarrassing. Are you able to ever compete again in motocross? No, uh, I'll, I'll never be able to compete. Thank you, Chip. I have no further questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rosen. Cross-examination, Mr. Penalty. Good morning, Mr. King. Good morning. As you know, I represent, I represent Galaxy Gravel, and I've got a couple of questions here to see if we can agree on. You do agree that there were signs all over the property, correct? There, there were signs there, yes. And there were actually gates blocking the entrance to the facility, correct? There, there were gates in front of the roads, yes. And do you recall seeing this particular sign and gate says no trespass? I, I did. And you testified earlier that you're actually part of the motocross team, correct? I am. And as part of the motocross team, coach is John Speed, correct? He is. And he told you on several occasions, because he does it every year, that if he catches any one of any anyone from the team in the pits, that they're off the team, correct? He did. And then he warned you of that. He warned everyone of that because John Speed says that it's, quote, unpredictable, correct? I'm not quite sure why he warned us, but he did warn us. All right. He also asked you to only ride in specially designated motocross tracks, correct? He did. And as in evidence, uh, the testimony of Mike Smith, your friend, uh, you agree that you both like to test the hills, correct? We did. And not only did you like to test the hills, but one of the exciting things about riding around there is that the terrain always changing. That's correct? Uh, it did. In fact, the gravel operations mean that Sometimes hills just disappear from week to week, correct? Uh, some hills did. All right, Mr. Penalty, if you could uh, take your exhibit off the screen, please. Thank you. Now, your, your testimony, prior testimony, is you were traveling at 10 kilometers per hour as you're going up the hill, correct? Yeah, like seven miles an hour. Okay. And you know that the, there's testimony by Ben Rogers, the defense accident reconstruction expert, that indicates that there was a 15-foot flat portion just before the cliff. Do you have any reason to dispute that? I... I, I don't know what his testimony was. I, I didn't see that. All right. And if his testimony is that there was skid marks on the portion, in other words, skid marks from you, your motorcycle on the top that suggested a speed of minimum of 30 miles per hour, you have no reason to dispute that, correct? Well, you yeah, know, there was a lot of skid marks up there, so I don't know what you saw. And if you were actually... <laughs> going at 10 miles per hour, that you would only need six to seven feet of stopping distance. You don't have any reason to dispute that, do you? On, on gravel? I, I, I don't know if, if that's right. But it could be correct, on, in your opinion. It, it you know, it, it depends on gravel I, I i don't know isn't it correct mr king that you were actually trying to test that hill and was traveling at over 30 miles per hour when you when you reached the point of that hill no 
And you also testified that you, you only wrote a few times. This photograph of, of uh, a motocross, that is you in full gear, correct? It is. And were you about to make a jump on that in that photograph? I, I, I don't know what's directly in front of me there. And do you recall if, if in that photograph you actually had made a jump from a distance on, in that photograph? I, I, I don't recall. All right, thank you very much, sir. Thank All right, you thank you very much, Council. Uh, as to uh, Ms. Brock or Mr. Rosen, anything, any further evidence from the plaintiff? Nothing further, Your Honor. Plaintiff rests? Nothing further, Your Honor. Plaintiff rests. All right, very good. We're now going to turn to the defense case, but before I do, um, is there anybody here who needs to uh, take a break or stop for uh, any reason? If so, uh, turn your microphone on and let us know. Otherwise, we're going to proceed straight to the defense case. Anybody say anything there? I didn't see. Okay, not hearing anything. We're going to turn to the defense case. And let's see here. We're going to start with Mr. Penalta on um, direct examination. So call your first witness, sir. May I please the court. Galaxy Gravel calls Fiona Frazier. All right, very good. Uh, Didi, uh, you unmute your microphone and swear. Um, Ms. Frazier, please. Is your right hand for me? Do you solemnly swear affirm <clears throat> that the testimony you should give in this case shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Please state your name. Fiona Frazier. Mr. Penalt. Please the court. Ms. Fraser, could you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about the family business? Uh, yes, hi. Um, I uh, have been working with my uncle, Michael Fraser, for since I was in high school at Galaxy, uh, Galaxy Gravel. Uh, I worked my way up to be the four person, and uh, I have learned how to do all the jobs there. Uh, there's, you know, there's just a, a few of us over the years that have have been there that long. We have. Uh, we do, I do excavating work. I use the front end loader. Uh, I do all the things. We take all the gravel and take it from the big, uh, the big lake there and, and, and make up piles. And then eventually with the, at different times, we then take the piles of gravel and dirt and we put them in trucks and deliver it to customers. Ms. Frazier, are you familiar with the uh, issues that were presented today about motor, motorcyclists uh, being on the property? I, I know I know what they're claiming, yes. Now, could you please tell us what actions uh, were taken by Galaxy to try to prevent the motorcycle drivers from coming in to, to, to the property? So many that it's hard to even be able to say them in a short amount of time. We have been uh, struggling with that for years and years and years. We have put up, um, you know, water. There's, we have the lake on a couple of the sides, but the other side, we put up the gate. We built a gate on the entrance way there. We put up signs everywhere: no trespassing signs, private property signs. We put, uh, we put. Uh, they take stuff down. They don't keep it up. They, they, they would come in on after hours in the weekends, and when we would see people there, they would almost those those kids would almost never come when we were open. They would come when we thought they we they thought we weren't there. Um, and I can tell you that, uh, you know, it, it went on for uh, forever with trying to figure out ways to get them to not come in. And honestly, uh, you know, I know that the owners um, had had sent, the owners of the property had sent in these consultants or some security people. I don't really know who kind of people they were, but they're the ones that gave us advice and said that uh, there wasn't really anything else that we could do to keep them out of there. And, uh, you know, I know that we all would yell at them to get out and it, it varied depending on who was there. Um, you know, it, 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 as to how many people would, you know, uh, come in, it would not be very frequently that I would see them only because they would try to do it when people weren't around. Well, I'll take us back to the date of the accident, May 1, 2017. Were you working that day? Yes, I was there all alone that day which is, is uh, not typical, but I was there all alone that day and I had a specific job to do because we, you know, we have these hills that are brought up by the, by the gravel and the, and the rocks. And there's, there's one way in and there's, that's the area where we have the gate. 
and near that uh, area is where the office is. And I was, I was at the, uh, at the time of the accident, I was at the office and, but the, which is to the side and I was unloading some tools. But earlier that day, I had had a big job of, of cause we had a big job that we had to deliver on that Monday. Uh, so I had excavated a bunch of rocks and, and gravel uh, out of this one hill and this one hill and I had, had done it with the excavator and the front end loader and I'd gotten it into the truck and then I had it ready to go for Monday morning. So it had just, you know, it just that work had just gone down that morning. And then I was over there by the, by the office and I was unloading my tools. And when I was unloading my tools into the office, I heard this crazy high pitched whining like of, of a motorcycle, just one. And it was super loud and super revved. And it sounded like, you know, going into some higher kind of, because my uncle told me that when you hear that higher gear like that, that meant that's when they were like, that would be like a, a, a faster thing. So all of a sudden I heard that and then I heard yelling I mean, of the person's, you know, yelling. And so I had to jump in my truck and it was a ways over there. I, ju I jumped in my truck and I went over there. I had never seen that person there that day. I had no idea there was anybody in there. They must have, they must have come right around when I wasn't around or didn't notice I was there or maybe purposely. I don't know what the heck was going on, but they, I had not seen them. And then they would have had to. Uh, then so they what they would do is they would go toward that when I ran to my my truck and I went over there I, I go up there and I see this this guy this young this got young guy and he had the motorcycle was still going and it was laying on him and he obviously was hurt so I called 911 right away and they came and they got him and um, and it was you know I felt terrible but I I could I couldn't even believe how he got there without me knowing he was there and I couldn't believe that he had uh, you know, driven up that hill when the hill clearly, when you see, that's the, that's what you would just seen that hill, right? When you walk, when you come in the entrance, I don't understand why he didn't know that that had been worked on that day. Cause they were, we were working on different ones all the time. I'm going to show you what's in evidence is exhibit one. It's the diagram of the, um, facility, right? It's the side office the, on the bottom, right? Yeah. That's where I was when I heard the, the, the rev of that mo of that motorcycle. And you can, and, and one that where the one is, that's where I had done all that work that day. And you can, and you, and where, I mean, it, I don't know what that means. Well-worn bike path, because that, that hill hadn't been there that long, but whatever that the sand and gravel removed, that's like, yeah, that's where I would have worked that day. And that's where he would have, you know, that's where he was when I took my truck and I drove down there. All right. And uh, you did, you did, um, actually take his motorcycle over to his parents, correct? I did, you know, there, <laughs> there was, there's a lot of nice houses, houses that had been built up near there. And it turned out when I asked him, like, I'll take your motorcycle, I'll tell your parents what happened because the, the EMS, you know, they came and got him. And so I said, I'd go take his bike back and he could, uh, and he, and I would tell his parents what happened to let him know. And yeah, I took his motorcycle back to one of those. He lived right in those nice houses over there. And I took uh, that and that's how he, you know, that's how I found out who they were and I, where he lived. And Ms. Frazier, we have agreed to, um, to the testimony of uh, the motocross, our motocross expert, Ben Rogers, but I just to set the, the tone on, on their, on his testimony. Were you present when that, that same day when he went to uh, the site and, and took measurements of the accident location? Yes, I was there. All right, nothing further. Thank you very much on cross-examination, uh, Ms. Brock. Thank you, may it please the court. Good morning, Ms. Fraser. Good morning. Uh, Ms. Fraser, you just told the jury that you were present when the defense expert came to evaluate the scene. Uh, you don't know how many dirt bike riders have been in that area since the date of the accident, do you? Well, I don't know, I mean, in the data, I mean, like where exactly? Like in our whole place or? Correct. Okay, in our place, I, you know, we we continued to try to yell at people for going in there. Um, we kept that one area this the same after that because we didn't know what was gonna happen. That's what the owners of the property told us to do because, you know, we don't own the property. We're just, we just rent that property. So the owners told us to keep it the way it was after we told them that somebody got hurt there. Uh, Fraser, uh, or excuse me, Galaxy Gravel uh, has leased the land where the accident happened for over 40 years. Okay. 
I, I don't know about the paperwork, you know, I don't get involved with that. <laughs> I just know we run it there. And your uncle, Michael Frazier, uh, he knows that the bikers have been there since day one, he described it, correct? Uh, we've had off and on for always, there's always been some sort of activity there to try to keep bikers out, yes, as far as I know. And your uncle knew that riders used the cliffs on that property? I don't know. If you mean the hills, they almost never would go up on those hills. They would go up on the sides. They would go up on the side and they would like, you know, that when you'd yell at them, that's what they would want to be doing. Almost never did they go up all the way to the top like that, where that kid was. But it's happened, yes. Uh, Galaxy Gravel did not do anything else except post no trespassing signs and put a gate at the entrance to keep the bikers away, correct? Well, we yelled at them whenever we could. Uh, we, we would do, we would, we, like I said, the owners of the property, because we told them that, you know, the, the neighbors were complaining and we were, we, we were, you know, think about it, trying to do your job with, you know, Pete, with kids coming in there and you're trying to do that. So we did everything we thought we could. And those people said there was nothing else they could have done, we could do other than uh, build the Great Wall of China is what they said. And that to keep those kids out, you know, so, and I can tell you when I was there by myself, I, you know, I, I, I wasn't the same as when there was other, I wouldn't yell at them as much because I would be a little nervous because of how some of them acted towards me. There was no, there was no fence around the property. Right. There, well, there's the lake on like most, a couple of the sides and then, right. Then there's the big, there's the front entrance and that's where the gate was. But no fence around the property. Right. And those dirt bikes make a lot of noise, don't they? When they're doing their thing. Yes. And so much so that the neighbors and the surrounding communities complain to the owners. Right, and that's why the owners brought people out to see what else we could do. And we tried I mean, what we could. It even got to the point that the mayor knew about the noise, the complaints about the noise, correct? Uh, I think that the, from what I, the mayor, I have no idea. I don't even know who the mayor is. Now, um, the diagram that we saw earlier, it shows a clear path that was packed by gravel going up the hill, correct? That's what that diagram says, but you got to remember that on the top of the hill, there would be no, I would never be on the top of the hill. I'm on the bottom of it. I'm like excavating. So I've never been on the top of the hills because I would be in my machinery. So I don't know what that meant, that hill, that path up there. Plus, you know, they don't let, they don't stay long the hill. But you knew before that hill was excavated that there was a well-worn path on the downslope as well. No, I did not know that. I, I did not know there was a, 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 I heard that, I heard, saw that on the sign on that picture, but I did not know of a path. Uh, your family owns Galaxy Gravel? Yes. And you're paid by Galaxy Gravel? Yes, yes ma'am. Thank you, nothing further. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, uh, one of the jury's jurors has posed a question to the witness. Uh, I reviewed the uh, question and I think it's an appropriate question. So I'm gonna read the question to the witness and you may answer the question. And if the attorneys have any follow-ups, they may. The juror's question to the witness is as follows. Did the defendant ever look into putting a fence around their entire property? An entire property is underlined to keep out the kids prior to the accident since the defendant had actual knowledge the kids were riding the motorbikes there. Ma'am, are you able to answer that question? Uh, well, I know that we had talked to the owner when the owner had sent those people out and the owner said that because the way the front area is that the only thing that the, the gate would be just necessary because that at the front there was a lot of uh, shrubbery and bushes and stuff that lined up up into the point of the gate. So my understanding was that that's all that they would do, but we, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't, we weren't the owners. Very good. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, you were entitled to uh, ask follow-ups, uh, Mr. Penalta first. Any follow-ups to that question? No, Your Honor. And on the defense side, uh, Ms. Brock, any follow-ups to that question? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. All right, uh, ma'am, you are excused. Um,
Mr. Penalta or Ms. Blackmore, any further uh, evidence from the defense? No further evidence. The defense rests. Defense rests. All right, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, then you've heard all of the substantive evidence uh, from both sides in this case. We are now going to proceed directly into the closing arguments of both sides. Uh, by rule, the plaintiff gets to go first and the defense second, and we'll start closing arguments on behalf of uh, the plaintiff King uh, by Mr. Rosen. Mr. Rosen, you have the floor. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. And uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Um, my time is limited, so I'm going to be brief. And uh, what I'd like to do is in a few minutes, you're going to have uh, the verdict form that you bring back to the room when you deliberate. And this is what it looks like. And I'm going to run through that verdict form with you and the questions that you're going to have to answer to decide this case. The very first question is, was the defendant Galaxy negligent? And if so, was that negligence a legal cause of Chip's injuries? And the answer to that question is absolutely yes. Um, you know, this defendant knew that kids were riding on the property for decades. You know, for year after year, this has been in business for since the 70s. And kids have been riding on this property and they knew about it. And they failed to take any steps to stop the kids from riding on the property. And, you know, the last witness mentioned that it would take the Great Wall of China to stop these kids from coming on the property. But that's not what they needed. They just needed a fence. Any type of fence would have done. It wouldn't have cost much and it would have prevented this accident from happening. Um, you know, the other thing they did is they failed to keep this property, knowing that these kids were coming on the property, they, feel that they failed to keep the property safe and it was a disaster waiting to happen. You know, um, uh, the last witness testified, Ms. Fraser testified that, you know, she removed half of a hill, which left a 15 foot cliff for Chip to fall off of. Um, you know, this is what it normally would look like and she turned it into a cliff, a dangerous condition with no warning, with no warning signs, no caution. Uh, and unfortunately, this was tragic for, for Chip and for his life. So was the defendant negligent in this case? The answer is absolutely yes. And so the first question you answer yes. The second question is gonna deal with whether Chip himself was negligent. And when you look at, when you look at that question, you need, to look, you need to ask yourself this. Um, what were the other kids like Chip doing at that time? What were kids his age with the same experience under similar circumstances doing? And all of them were riding over at Galaxy's gravel pit. That's where they went because Galaxy let them do it. They allowed it, they permitted it. And so they were responsible for making sure that that property was safe when kids were on their property. Um, and so they failed to meet their obligations. And so, um, you know, when you come to this question, was Chip himself, the 13 year old who was doing what everyone was doing under like circumstances that were his age? The answer is no. If you answer yes to the question, you, you need to apportion fault and decide who bears the lion's share of fault in this case. You know, was it a, was it a corporation, a sophisticated company that's been in business for, you know, uh, 40 years, knowing that these kids are coming on their property, knowing that they, that they could have just simply put up a fence to stop it and they chose not to, um, or was it a 13 year old kid who was doing what everyone else was doing? And so I would suggest you 95% of fault, if you answer um, yes to the prior question, 95% of fault would, would lie with the defendant, uh, the plaintiff, 5%. The next question you're gonna have to decide is the amount of damages. You know, there's no question that this young boy has suffered a, a terrible you know, fracture to his arm that has affected him up until this day that will affect him for the rest of his life. Uh, and you know, the, the stipulated past medical expenses are 25,000. He just received an MRI, which is $2,500 and $250,000 for future care for this boy is not unreasonable for the injuries that he suffered. And you heard there has been no other accident or injury that he's, that's occurred since this accident that happened on May 1, 2017. Yeah, sure, he tried to ride his motorcycle a couple of times, but he couldn't do it. It caused too much pain. So we'd ask you to uh, answer number four, that would be $277,500. The last question on the verdict form, which is the most important question, is how this accident, how this crash will affect and plague this young boy for the rest of his life. Well, you know, what is the type of pain, suffering, disability, physical impairment, loss of enjoyment of life? How is it gonna affect him going forward? And it's stipulated he is gonna live for another 61 years. He's only 16 years old. 16 years old, he's gonna live for another 61 years. He can't lift his arm above his chest. He has difficulty getting dressed. He needs help doing chores around the house. You know, we've been in a quarantine from COVID-19 for two months. 
two months, and this boy has 61 years. That's over 732 more months of his life not being able to use his arm like a normal person. And that's a tragedy, and that's going to affect him forever. And so I'm going to suggest to you the number, the amount that you allow in your verdict needs to reflect the severity of the injury and how long that injury will affect this young boy. And so I'm going to suggest to you a number. The, the amount is up to you. You decide. But I'm going to suggest to you $4 million is not an unreasonable amount of money for the next 60 plus years, 732 months. Thank you for your service. On behalf of my client, on behalf of the um, uh, King family, thank you so much. All right, Mr. Rosen, thank you very much. Uh, if we could get back off the share screen, thank you. And uh, Ms. Blackmore will uh, close the case uh, for the defense. Ms. Blackmore. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, members of the jury. The first question for you to decide is, was my client, Galaxy Gravel, negligent? And the answer to that question is no. Chip King was negligent. We know that he was 13 years old at the time of this accident, and he had already been riding motor bikes, dirt bikes, since the age of nine for three to four years. He was an experienced motocross rider. He had a coach. He had, he was on the team at school and his coach testified that he thought it was very important to instill to the team members that they should only ride on designated motocross tracks. He told them, if I ever catch you riding those motorbikes at the gravel pit, you're gonna be thrown off the team. He said, we all know that riding motocross bikes is dangerous. And we also know that the terrain changes on a daily basis in a gravel pit. That's why he didn't want the team members to even attempt to ride there. Now, Skip or Chip knew this and he knew that he was not supposed to enter the property. He was aware of all of the gates to all of the uh, road entrances with no trespass signs. There were private property, no trespass signs all over the perimeter of the property. He knew that, he knew it was wrong and he did it anyway. He went there anyway. His, his friend, Mike Smith, said it was popular to, to, to try to go up those hills because it was, it was really exciting because you could gain a lot of speed on the way down. And he also was taught the proper method of going up a steep hill. Uh, his coach told us that he taught these kids the proper method to go up a, a steep hill and to maneuver dangerous uh, situations that you may incur. Now, our expert, uh, Ben Rogers, told you that the proper method of going up a steep hill is to keep your feet on the footrest. Your uh, uh, video cut out, you may want to start again on that last sentence. Our expert, Ben Rogers, told us the proper method of traversing a steep hill is to keep your feet on the footrests. If you don't keep your feet on the footrests, you lose traction. And what did what did Chip do? He didn't keep his feet on the footrest. He was walking up the hill at, he says, 10 kilometers. And when Fiona was working, she suddenly hears what sounded like a motorcycle in third gear, in third gear. So when Ben went to the accident site, which was preserved, took measurements. He saw that he had clearly 
15 feet of area to bring his motorcycle to a stop. Now, he's an experienced driver, experienced rider, and had he been going only 10 kilometers, as he said, he could have brought his bike to a stop within five to six feet. But that didn't happen. And the reason it didn't happen is because he wasn't going 10 kilometers. He was going at least 30 kilometers per hour. And that's why he could not stop in time. And unfortunately, he caused his own injuries. He assumed the risk of a dangerous activity and he knew that he wasn't supposed to be on that property. He disregarded all the signs. Now, it's, it's a shame that he fractured his arm. Uh, and as far as Ms. this- Ms. more you cut out again. Uh, start your last sentence again, please. It is a, it's a shame that he fractured his left arm. Um, that fracture was minimally displaced. It was set in place, casted for a few weeks, and it healed. And he was back on his bike, and he was posting pictures on social media of him back on his bike. Now I'm going to try this one more time to show you the uh, the picture that was posted. Well, I seem to be having an issue with this. So can my defense IT person please post exhibit on, there four? It is. There it is, ma'am. Okay, there he is in full motocross regalia. He's, this is after our accident. He's in his full gear and he continued to ride. Um, there is a huge gap in treatment. We have no idea when these neurological symptoms even started. Um, he didn't see a neurologist for nearly three years. There were no follow-up studies done. We only had an x-ray of the arm. No one even bothered to x-ray his elbow or his shoulder or take an MRI until February 2020 and only one MRI of the cervical spine was taken. We have no idea when this nerve injury started and we're really not sure if it was this accident that caused it. Dr. Dangerfield has no qualifications to, to give opinions on what type of surgery, if surgery is necessary, and how much it will cost. He doesn't perform surgery. This man hasn't even been evaluated by a neurosurgeon and was just seen for the first time by a neurologist. So we submit to you that Galaxy Gravel did what a reasonable gravel operation would do. This is a family business and they are a working gravel pit and everybody knows that. Everybody knows that those mounds of sand, those piles of sand are changing on a daily basis. And Fiona Fraser was simply doing her job that day. She had no idea that Chip uh, snuck in to the property, the private property, and violated the no passing or no trespassing signs. And had she seen him, she would have told him to leave. But what she did here was a motorcycle in third gear that's consistent with our experts' testimony and the physical evidence that he was speeding up that hill. He was not acting as a reasonable rider of a dirt bike would act under similar circumstances. And for that reason, we ask you to check the uh, no box to question number one on the verdict form and to find for the defendant. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, counsel.
All right, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you've now heard all of the evidence in the case from both sides. I'm now going to instruct you on some substantive instructions that you must use in deciding the case, as well as some procedural instructions. And by agreement of the attorneys, these will all be read uh, together. Normally they're separated, but we're gonna read them together and I am going through. All right, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, negligence is the failure to use reasonable care which is the care that a reasonably careful person would use under like circumstances. Negligence is doing something that a reasonably careful person would not do under like circumstances or failing to do something that a reasonably careful person would do under like circumstances. Reasonable care on the part of a child is the care that a reasonably careful child of the same age, mental capacity, intelligence, training and experience would use under like circumstances. In a civil case, greater weight of the evidence means the more persuasive and convincing force and effect of the entire evidence in the case. If the greater weight of the evidence does not support the plaintiff's claims, then your verdict should be for the defendant. However, if the greater weight of the evidence supports the plaintiff's claims, then you shall consider the defenses raised in this case. If the greater weight of the evidence shows that both plaintiff and defendant were each negligent, and that the negligence of each contributed as a legal cause of damages sustained by the plaintiff, you should decide and write on the verdict form what percentage of the total negligence of both parties to this action you apportion to each of them. You should award plaintiff an amount of money the greater weight of the evidence shows will fairly and adequately compensate him for damages incurred in the case. Any notes you've taken during the trial may be taken to the jury room for use during your discussions. When you go to the jury room, the first thing you should do is choose a presiding juror to act as the foreperson during the deliberations. Your verdict in this case must be unanimous. That is, your verdict must be agreed to by each of you. When you have agreed on a verdict and finished filling out the form, your foreperson should signal the deputy. At the same time, you should email the verdict to me at jtutor at 17thfloridacourts.org. Once we assemble, all the trial participants will be brought back into the courtroom and we will publish your verdict. If any of you need to communicate with me during the course of your deliberations for any reason, you should send me a note and email it to the same email address. Please be patient. We will respond to your question via email. You may now retire to, the, to consider your verdict. There's a couple of other instructions I wanted to bring to your attention here. One is, uh, I am designating Mr. Scarola to accept the fillable PDF verdict form on behalf of the jury. You'll receive that via email once you go into your break room to consider the case. That does not mean I'm appointing you the foreperson. It will be up to the jury to, cons to decide who the foreperson will be. Once the foreperson is decided, that person will be responsible for filling out the verdict form, putting a digital signature on it, and returning it to me via email. As I said, once we get it back, uh, I will signal all the participants to rejoin us uh, in the trial, and we will publish your verdict at that time. You may now retire to just consider your verdict in the case. All right, Orlando, if you take them to the uh, break I will. room. I'll be here on it. Judge Tudor? Yes. The jury has uh, reached a verdict. They should be sending it out shortly. Thank you very much. All right, everybody could uh, be on standby to receive the verdict. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I received the verdict. Uh, as you can mute your microphone again, Dee Dee. Uh, everybody looks to be back. Uh, bring the jury in and we'll publish the verdict. The jurors are all in the courtroom. All right, thank you, um, Mr. Garcia. All right, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the jury's returned a uh, lawfully uh, filled out and completed verdict. And I will read the verdict, uh, or publish the verdict right now. Uh, the first question the jury was asked was, was the defendant negligent? Excuse me, forgive me. Was the defendant negligent? And if so, 
was such negligence a legal cause of the plaintiff's loss, injury, or damage? The jury's answers to question number one is yes. The jury was instructed then, if your answer to question one is yes, answer question two. Question two is, was the plaintiff himself negligent? And if so, was such negligence a contributing legal cause of the plaintiff's injuries? The jury's answer to question number two is yes. Jury then is, is, is told if they answered uh, yes to that question to answer the next question. The question then is state the percentage of fault, which is a legal cause of plaintiff's injuries. The jury as to this question answers as follows. The defendant, 60%, the plaintiff, 40%. Both of those total 100%. What is the total amount of plaintiff's damages for medical expenses incurred in the past and medical expenses to be incurred in the future? Jury's answer is $100,000. Last question on the verdict then is, what is the total amount of plaintiff's damages for pain and suffering, disability, physical impairment, mental anguish, inconvenience, the loss of capacity for the enjoyment of life in the past and to be sustained in the future? The jury's answer to this question is $250,000. So say we all signed by Jack Scarola, the four person in the case. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, if you would please then all of you unmute your microphone, the jury only, unmute your microphone. And when everybody is unmuted, I'm going to ask you two questions. And I need you to answer audibly to these questions. The first question is, is the verdict I just read and published in open court your verdict? If it is, everyone to that answering that question, if it is yes, please say yes. 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 If any, if anyone on the jury uh, would like to answer that the pub, the verdict I published is not your verdict, please say no. Having none, uh, the jury published being published. I uh, accept the jury's verdict in this case. Anything further from the attorneys? No, Your Honor. Nothing from the defense. Very good, ladies and gentlemen of the jury and participants in the trial. I thank you very much for your hard work, dedication, and uh, deliverance in uh, helping us conduct this trial. Uh, and I accept the jury's verdict, and we are off the record.